Another evening of Museum in Lotus. Welcome back, uh, 7.30. Always this Tuesday, we will always uh, be looking at many different collections, not for sale, owned by Master Yuan. And then hopefully from there, we get a closer touch and stepping into the universe, getting closer to the universe of Master Yuan's art. Am I right, Mr. Pino? Absolutely, yes. Of course, we have Mr. Pino, Mr. Joseph and Joseph with us, uh, expert on such matters. And... Uh, from there, we can understand more. I have a question today. I mean, the, the friends are already saying hi. I, let me talk to the, let us talk to the friends first, huh? Yes. And the 
Maria Jose, Maria Jose, yeah. Um, Eileen and the Laura is here, I can see some of y'all. If you're here, it'd be nice to say hi in the comments because I can see some of your names, but I can definitely see your name if you drop a message and say hi, okay? Uh, Andy, as I said, uh, Stephen Le is all here and so on. Okay, so I, I see Laura as well, I think. Uh, thank you for watching tonight. Um, I sent a, I shared the post and I actually uh, put a tagline there, which I'm going to ask everyone. Uh, Amanda is here today as well. I'm going to ask everyone and especially I'm going to ask Mr. Pino right after this that what if, what if, what if, Okay, it's just a question. Uh. Yeah, uh, good for thoughts. Because after all, Mr. Pino, you were a banker, right? Yes. Uh, Pino was a banker, so definitely he has met some of the very uh, wealthy people uh, all around in your many years of career. I did. Okay. Uh, what if, uh, let's say, in the event that you are actually one of the richest person in the world, what would you do? I'm not just talking about rich, you know. I'm talking about riches. What if you are one of the richest person in the world, what would you do? It's a difficult question to answer, but uh, I believe uh, that it would be important, uh, having been blessed with, with so much wealth, uh, to be in the position to pass uh, some of that wealth uh, also to other people and the people who mostly need it. I was actually recently looking and Ratna uh, Tata, which is one of the most important uh, figures uh, in uh, the world of automobile, actually they bought Rolls Royce. Uh, I mean, when you see the amount uh, of uh, profit uh, that they provide to charity, it really touched me because I also saw the wealth of many other Indian families, uh, and I don't see that happening. And I believe that whatever goes out, in one form or the other, may come back, as long as we don't have any expectation. But this is me, other people, and I respect a different thought. I, so I push the same question forward to uh, those who are viewing, to, to you who are viewing. What if, just imagine, I mean, it's good. We always encourage people to do some meditation. So one day, not just imagine that you'll get wealthy, but what if you are one of the richest person on earth? What would you exactly do, right? I mean, that begs a lot of questions. You see some of the top richest people in the world. I see Eileen and Andy says that Anna is with us. Actually, I can't see her. Yeah, so uh, Anna, Eileen, thank you very much for coming. Uh, what if you are one of the richest, you were one of the richest person on earth? What would you do with all the wealth and definitely that comes along with it, the influence? What would you do uh, in such an extent? Madam Lai is here. I'm asking a question. I'm asking a question. If you're the richest person in the world, you the richest person in the world, you would do with all those wealth and all those influence, right? Uh, Mr. Pino mentioned, you can, you can think about this topic today and even into your sleep, you know. Uh, good question to ask yourself, and uh, of course, if you want to share, you can share in the comments as well about what you would you would like to have. Jack Lim is here. You see, I can see people greeting each other, but I can't see uh, if you don't comment uh, in it. So if you can comment in it, then I will know that you are here. I can say hi to you. Uh, okay, Mr. Pino mentioned that uh, if he has, if he is one of the wealthiest person on earth, then uh, he would be giving to the many who are. Uh, in need. Am I right? I think I would. I, I sincerely think that I would. Yes. So, what we see from Mr. Pino, uh, it's very different. Your disposition and your choice, it's very different from the main character we are going to talk about today. Yes. One of the main characters we are going to talk about today. Yes. And yes. Uh, to talk about this main character, we have to start from uh, we have to start from the figurine or the Pura sculpture. Yes. This antique that is between me and Mr. Pino, right? Uh, Betsy, I think is here. Okay, thanks Andy for tagging Anna. Uh, hi Laura, thank you very much for liking and sharing. So we have someone in the middle. Yes. Um, this person or this sculpture or the story behind this sculpture has very much got to do with um, the question that I was talking about just now. Yes. 
right? It's very relevant. And uh, if, uh, if, hi Betsy, uh, and if you find this sculpture familiar, probably we can get a close up on the face and all. Uh, for sure, it's a uh, Pura sculpture. It's a Buddha sculpture. Uh, but it's a distinctive one. It's, it's, it's a different one from the ones that we see before. And you are absolutely right. Uh, probably we can get a name to it first. How do yes, you address sir. this Buddha sculpture? This Buddha sculpture is actually called Jambu Pati. And you possibly might have seen in the past, in past episodes, we did show some Jambu Pati beautiful a sculpture. They were in uh, cast uh, bronze. I this think, right, I think uh, the name Jampu Pati rings a bell, huh? Rings a bell. And yeah. if you look at it, the, I think probably we're looking at the same features. I remember there was this episode, if you do remember and be following, that uh, there were smaller sculptures. You mentioned bronze, do you? Or copper, bronze? Bronze. Uh, and uh, they had about the same features, which was a distinctive thing about it. These parts, these parts, here and something here. Absolutely, yes. Right? At least these few parts were distinctive. Yes. Um, uh, and they look like, you know, jewelries. They look like jewelries that are so extravagant. If I'm right, we actually mentioned about, we actually showed something like that similar, not by the same material, not in the same scale or size. Uh, and it was earlier episodes. I think we have some photos of um, the previous. Yes, this is the one. Am I right? Yes. This is the one. Yes. We, we have, I think we showed about a few of them uh, uh, in that episode. Absolutely, but yes. If, if you have been following, hi Yvonne, hi Betsy, if you have been following Museum in Lotus, you will find this pretty much familiar. I think we brought this during the uh, episode or during the event uh, or the day that was close to uh, Tipa Valley. That uh, we, uh, and then we had the medicine puda, something like that all around, yeah, and then we left these uh, sculptures uh, in the gallery for a bit of time for everyone to actually uh, pray to it. And uh, we know there's a high Geraldine, we know that there's something with this Buddha that is very special. And if I'm right, native to Burma, Myanmar. Native to Burma. You see, after 40 episodes, I think I'm quite getting <laughs> a hang of what's going on. Yes, yeah, you are. On where all this, you know, you, we might think that we are pretty learned before this, but I tell you, as you go deeper, then you will know what you do not know, and then you realize that, oh my God, there's so many things I do not know yet. For instance, this Buddha, or what we call, do we call it the Jampu Pati Buddha? Is Jambu that how we call Pati. it? Jampu Pati. Jampu Pati Buddha uh, is native and very unique to the land of Burma, and has every ounce got to do with the question that I asked you just now, what would you do if you were one of the richest persons on earth? Uh, to get to that, Probably we can have a brief story yes. about why is it called the Jampu Pati Buddha. First of all, you recognize something which is uh, very important. There's no Buddha in any place in the world uh, that has these characteristics. And the characteristics uh, are the wings uh, that it has uh, on the head uh, and the wings uh, also are seated on the shoulders. Right. Okay, we know that it's a Buddha because of the elongated ears. And when we look at the ears, we see again this uh, beautiful details that would tell you this is a Buddha. Yes. Nothing else but a Buddha. So we are in Burma, we are looking at the Jambu Pati, and it's full of jewelry. And that makes me think, but usually a Buddha should not have jewelry. You, you isn't, you're right, isn't it? I, uh, what do you call it? Is it ironic, oxymoron, or paradoxical? It's that, paradoxical. That, you know, yes. we, have, we have seen Buddha sculptures before. Yes. Many in our Many. episodes. Remember the one from Laos? Yes. Uh, simple, standing there, classy, uh, with uh, very little adornment and jewelry. Very little. And even for the ones that are, are more native to uh, Chinese uh, Buddhism. Absolutely, yes. You have a good sash, you have uh, all this, uh, you know, but very little jewelry you will find very on Very little jewelry. But this one, the Jampu Pati Puda, it's one that is full of riches, full of full. jewelry. It's so much and so outstanding that it stems all the way from the crown to the back of the ear and touching the shoulder and so on. You've got to come and see this yourself if, uh, if this piece is going to be 
here for a long time. Uh, and it really has a lot. And I mean, there's more than that. There's all a lot of details here. I'm not sure we can capture them all. So why? Why does this paradoxical nature happen? It's a very good question. And let me say, why do they call a Buddha a Jambupati? Jambupati. Why? There must be a reason, and the, the reason is very simple. Jambupati was a very rich, extremely rich, arrogant king in Burma. And he wanted to challenge his strength, he wanted to challenge his power, and wanted to even have what the Buddha had, and that was the enlightenment. He thought that he could conquer everything. He could have everything as long as he wanted. And he had all the money possible in this so world. We are talking about a person or a king. A king. Whose name is Jampupati. Jampupati. That means Jampupati isn't the name of the Buddha. Not it's the name of the Buddha. The name of this king who is super rich and as a king and with all the wealth, he definitely has all the influence. And for him, when this question was posed to him, what if, no, he is, he is, he was, or at least, the, one of the richest person on earth. Uh, and what did he do? He tried to challenge Buddha himself. Try to challenge Buddha. Right. And interestingly enough, uh, the Buddha basically wanted to give him an example and therefore, he could have everything, but in one occasion, he pretended. And therefore, he wore this very rich jewelry. Let's not forget that the Buddha himself was a prince who abandoned all his wealth. But in this occasion, he wore the best possible clothes. You look attentively at his chest, covered with multiple necklaces. Uh, look at all the ornament, extravagant, opulent. And he decided to have a, a, a palace where he would show himself after having invited the Jambu Party to visit him. Which means that you're saying in order to convince this very rich king, Buddha himself, he transformed or he won or, or he transformed or he manifested or he put on uh, a lot of the jewels. Yes. And just and it seems as if that he would be richer than King Jambupati. Yes. And he went to a palace or he manifested a palace that was so grand that even the richest king, King Jambupati, would be put to shame. Put to shame. So there we have, I mean, on the surface, it seems like it's a contest of like who has the bigger palace, who has more jewels, who has more extravagance. And the main aim of Buddha doing that was to show you, see if you want to compete in wealth, I can be wealthier than you anytime. Anytime. But this is, but probably Buddha's message to him was that, but that's not the point. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is about having humility. The point is about not to focus absolutely everything about your wealth that you have. And arrogance. Sometimes arrogance. Uh, yes. the wealth goes with arrogance. So when the Jambu Party saw the palace and actually looked at the Buddha, immediately realized that the Buddha was in a very higher position than himself. He gave everything up. He became a monk. Right. So this is the lesson that you get. Aim at the wealth, the wealth is important, but let it not be the only asset, the only value that you have in life. And this is a wonderful story, beautiful, deep story that tells you there will always be somebody richer than you. Don't compete. Be contented with what you have. And I add a little bit of uh, my sentiment. If you can help and or extend a helping hand and make a brother or sister smile, do it. It doesn't cost anything. Right. So we see that this King Jampupati, with all the wealth and influence that he had, um, but uh, 
he just think that the dollars and cents probably at the yes. jewels adding yes. up would be all that he's worth would yes. be what that defines him so he with that he thinks that he has a strength and power to challenge the Buddha you know th it, this is something that might be similar even though it's a bygone era yes long long ago that uh, a lot of people are you know a lot of people are actually restricted Singaporeans actually are generally not poor they're actually quite okay well to do but a lot of people are actually restricted by the amount of dollars and cents they have. And uh, I suppose when Puda transformed into such a, manifested into a Jampu Party Puda, what we call it today, with all the jewels and, and, and palaces and so on, is to show that, yes, it's great to be wealthy, but uh, do not be restricted by it. If uh, the, 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 the King Jampu Party, he was restricted by the wealth that he had, and uh, that's it. And he, in fact, the, the wealth, it's everything about him. Nothing else? Nothing else. And I suppose Buddha wanted him to see that, that there's something more that can be done. So it's really the, the whole idea was to teach him the humility, you know, not just about yourself, there's a greater community out there, the Buddhism, the Sangha, the, the monks, and, and so on. So this is what we have. And I, I'm sure back in the days, may I ask about the age of this particular piece? Two things I would like to say. This has been meticulously carved and the wood here is teak, not easy to carve uh, teak. It was carved in teak and uh, it dates 19th century. So we're talking about a period uh, uh, which is very important for the Burmese uh, style and it could have been 1880s, uh, 1890s uh, to early 1910, 1920s, but I believe it's more the 19th century that the, that the 20th century. 200 years, 200 years plus minus. Yes. 200, 200 plus years. minus, that means that this piece of wood, it's not bronze, mind you, it's wood. Uh, it's supposed to portray a most luxurious, most opulent uh, Jampu Pati Puda. And uh, if you manage to zoom in to see, other than the crown jewels that uh, Jampu Pati Puda has, is that, am I right, it was, there are many rings to it. I see that this is a pedestal. Yes. One ring of something here, second yes. ring, and you have where Puda was sitting on this whole thing. The calves around the legs, uh, the jewels on the chest and so on. They have remnants yes. of gold. Yes, they, it, it was gilded. Uh, and we can even see the face. At one point in time, the gilding covered the face. I can see it around the nose. Look how beautiful the face. Look how beautiful the expression. He has downcast eyes. The eyes have been painted. Look at the, the nose, so refined. Look, he's in meditation. And we understand that by two details. One is this hand here, when the palm and in, in this case is the left hand palm, is on his legs. That means meditation. Plus there's another element here. And if we look at the hand and we look at the right hand, it's stretched with the palm pointing at the earth. It's asking the earth to witness the status of enlightenment. He's comfortably cross-legged, cross seated. This is the lotus uh, position. And the lotus position is relatively easy to distinguish because the palm of the foot basically is upwards. Full uh, lotus position. Full lotus position. Very beautifully rendered. And when you look at all the details that uh, Mr. Khan was actually showing us very, very refined. This is a double pedestal. It, it's almost, and it's round. Right. It's almost like an hourglass. This is the way that we can explain it. One thing which is quite interesting is, I mean, when you look at the proportion of the Buddha and you look at the pedestal, the pedestal is quite tall. Why, I ask you, the pedestal is so tall? Is that on purpose or is that, it's, it's a way of expressing something without writing. It's the reverence that the Burmese people 
recognized in this beautiful Buddha. It's the reverence. The, tallest, the taller the pedestal, the more important was the figure. And this is important for two reasons. It's the Buddha and an expression of wealth the, which overcomes wealth. The, the idea that the Jampupati Buddha was supposed uh, this Buddha was supposed to show that uh, wealth is important. If not, you wouldn't have such a sculpture in the first place. Uh, but to be uh, imprisoned by the concept of money alone would be a curse. Uh, we would just end up like Jampu Party, you know, uh, with a lot of um, arrogance. And, um, and what Buddha was trying to show that, you know, one can be richer anytime if you follow the right path. Yes. And uh, if you manage to follow the right path, that means you, do, you have to let go a little bit of your... In today's world, we will call it ego. You let go of your ego, right? Uh, and then you can find that you will immerse yourself in a greater community, in a greater belief, in a greater spirit, that actually, you know, by then to attain more wealth is actually very easy, but never be trapped by it. So this is Jumbo Party that we have here. And uh, if we turn back the time, 200 over years ago, this Buddha will be sparkling with gilded gold at many, many different uh, areas and segments that we see, truly representing how luxurious and how prosperous, how opulent a Buddha sculpture can be. And to think back at the time that the people would say that, okay, because we have to create a Jampu Party Buddha, we are going to not like King Jampu Party. We are going to offer our riches, we're going to offer our wealth to make a Buddha sparkling with gold. Uh, that's yes. the... The whole thing. I, I believe that what you've said summarized very well the concept. I would uh, also think that the sense of superiority which Jambu Pati felt in respect of the Buddha was actually crashed. And I think this is very meaningful because wealthy people at times uh, believe uh, that they are superior. It's not true. Money cannot make you superior. Money can allow you to buy many things which other people cannot buy, but cannot be superiority. We all are human beings, and we all need each other in different ways. Right. So that is a, the concept. This concept, it's interesting. And... Uh, and if we extend that, and we find that on the other side of things, uh, other than Buddha telling uh, King Jampupati that, you know, if I want to be wealthier than you, any time I can be. Uh, of course, if you see, there are four bowls, in our bowls if I might use that word, yes. uh, in front of us, and actually has got to do with the same idea all along. Um, that this practice is telling the believers uh, to be always giving. Am I correct? To say I, that, I, think, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. So uh, we have four different bowls here. We put them together together with uh, this uh, Jampu Pati Buddha. Even though, am I right, they're not from the same region? They are actually very close by, very but close. not exactly the same country. No. Not exactly the same country. No. Uh, are these four from the same place? They are from the same place. They're from the same place. Yes. And uh, maybe we mention what are these bowls used for first? Okay, they were used as offer, to offer. They were also used as uh, decoration items. They were used at home often. They would put a leaf, a banana leaf, and they would put the rice with a beautiful silver spoon. And that possibly leads you to think that this was Siam. Now it's Thailand. So these bowls were used to give offerings. Give offerings, uh, yes. Um, to give offerings to monks and... Uh... I think it was to give offerings. I believe that the rich people also knew that the monks did not have much. And the monks had all the expenses related to the monastery that actually they lived in. And therefore, there were the times where the roof uh, would come down or they would have other necessity. And uh, instead of giving money, they would offer bowls like this, which eventually 
the monks would actually sell, raise the money for the works. So they were important gifts. They were not simple gifts. And of course, they come from very rich family. It was a, a way of giving, knowing what the finality would be. So it's just very generous uh, and providing like a bank account, uh, you can utilize this little amount or big amount for the time of difficulties and for specific uh, needs, which were again were to eat or to basically repair the monastery and so on and so forth. So the same question was posed to the owners or the commissioners of this silver? Yes. Of this, this is, this is pure silver. This is pure silver. What I'm holding is a pure silver bowl. The same question that was posed to King Jampupati was posed to the owners or the, at least the commissioners of uh, this pure silver bowls from the Siam region, which is what we know now as Thailand, that what if you are one of the wealthiest or what if you are rich enough, let's say, uh, King Jampupati, before he was uh, subdued, in a sense, or before he was convinced by Lord Puda, he challenged. Uh, they say that, okay, my wealth is everything. You know, I should be number one in the world, including I should be a Buddhahood immediately. Yes. And for the commissioners and the owners of this silver bowls, pure silver bowls, it sounds great, yeah, it sounds wonderful. Yes. Uh, what they decide, and when they were posed this question, they are wealthy enough, that they decide that they, they will come up with such bowls, that would serve as uh, vessels to uh, present offerings to the monkhood. Yes. Uh, and to support the spread of Buddhism uh, in their state. Am I yes, right? Exactly. So we see uh, two different ways of handling wealth, right? Uh, and of course, one has to be wealthy to be able to do, come up with something like this. I mean, one look at this, we have four bowls here. Each of them have different designs. And of course, I suppose the one in the center is the one that is uh, the most highlighted one of all because it's extremely big. It, this is pure silver. This is pure silver. And if I'm right, uh, if I'm right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. We talked about silver before. Yes. We talked about sterling silver. Correct. Sterling silver is called sterling silver because it's at 95%. Yes. Uh, if these are from Siam, yes. if these are from Thailand, they are purity would match or even be higher than sterling silver. I think you're absolutely right. So, yes. So these are not just ordinary uh, 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 metal bowls. These are silver, which is very valuable. Uh, the engravings, we are going to touch on it uh, briefly, that uh, these are made and these are commissioned by well-to-do families to show their humility, to show their respect, to give back, per se, to the Buddhist community. Am I right? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So of these four pieces, which should we be... Okay, this is the biggest of the pieces. A lot of rice can be contained. Yeah. It could <laughs> contain a lot of rice. It's the most beautiful in many ways, because here the two techniques which we have touched in the past of repoussé and chasing. Repoussé means basically to push out the metal which is done by the silversmith with the appropriate uh, um, utensils. And then there's the opposite technique, which would push back the metal. So that the details that are then left on the metal are very distinct, very precise. And if you do come, and I come to the gallery, please look. You don't even need, for these, the magnifying glass. You would be able to see the figures, uh, and actually you would be able to see the faces, not only. You would see, and when you touch, you would feel the raised uh, repoussé technique. You know, if it was just meant as to give offerings. Give it offerings. Could be, uh, it could be any materials. Okay, first, sorry, a, a, a guide a concept to the age of all these four bowls. Okay, these are all uh, Ratanakosin. Uh, Ratanakosin is uh, an era and is related uh, to monarchs. Uh, and in this period, uh, 
the period goes between 1782 to roughly 1932. So in my opinion, this would be early 1900s. Uh, so I would say this would be 1910? 100 years, 110 years. 110? It could even be 1880 or 1890. It's 100, 100, 120, 130 years. Yes. Differently from the silver that we have in United Kingdom, there were all marks that would tell you exactly the date, the year, not the date, the year in which the silver product was made. We don't have it here. But I will also tell you that behind, underneath actually, there are some seals. But before we enter into this last concept, let me give you a description. Okay, if you come and you touch any of this bowl, you would right. see that the rim is turned inwards. And I was actually looking and thinking, but why do we have this round rim turning inwards? Very simple. After a minute of thinking, I said, it's because this rim will give strength and solidity to this bowl. Now imagine this bowl, all of this bowl, have been made out of a thin or thicker sheet of silver. And just by hammering with care, with attention, there's not one hole. That means there's not been one mistake by the silversmith uh, in order to create a hole in this bowl. And I will tell you about the silversmith. Uh, now, when we look at this bowl, we see two, two basically, two um, ornaments. Uh, the first uh, two, and uh, they represent actually diamonds, the first and the second. Then what we find here we find six, what I would define as cartouche. Uh, six, right? It's like a, it's like a cartouche, but uh, it's it's not it's not exact. Yeah, it's like a cartouche. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it, it's 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 oblong. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a main shape thing. Yeah. It's that, it's that an oblong there. thing, and they're actually almost connected. But when I look at the design, I see in this bowl alternating designs. So we see one figure, followed by a different figure, and then again another figure. So let me tell you, let's examine, first of all, the outer part of this larger band. It's so meticulously rendered by these continuous little squares. Very beautiful and mad work. It must have taken days to get this. Then we enter the cartouche, oblong, and when we look at the cartouche here, we see two images. Now, first of all, look at the background of the cartouche. It has trees, and all the trees are all very close one to another, which makes me think that this is a forest. When we look at the when we look at the figure, beautiful sinuous uh, figure, and we see the arms are lifted in opposite direction. In this particular figure, we see weapons uh, on both sides. When we look at the base of this forest, uh, I see grass. Uh, or in other vegetation. You look at the trees. They are so finely rendered. And thick as well. And thick. So while you say it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beaten out one of one piece of silver, Yes. a lot of consideration was put back in, probably attached silver was to it, to make this texture alive. Uh, so it, it feels very 3D. It, it is very 3D. And this was not an easy work. This was really by a, a master silversmith. And I will tell you something about my take about the silversmith. Then we see in the next cartouche oblong, we see another figure and 
again, this other figure has one arm with a weapon, weapon, the right arm, the left arm, seems to be touching the trees. And it's one after the other. When we look at the background in the cartouche, again, we see little small details. Right. Finally, at the bottom of this band, we see two smaller bands with uh, beautiful decoration. Now, right. you look at the back of this uh, beautiful bowl. Okay, we have uh, one, two, three, and four little feet, rounded feet, and then we have circles. And when we see the circle, let me just highlight the central one. It, has a, it is a flower with eight petals. Now, when we look very, very carefully at what's inside, we can hardly distinguish the seal, and the seal makes us think about, guess what? A Chinese uh, silversmith. That is a yin and yang symbol, if I'm right. Absolutely, yes. And uh, you are saying that there are seals there. I can there see. are seals. Very there difficult seals. to read. What we've been able to establish, possibly a name, which it sounds two like... Seals, yeah. two, yes. And this is basically Chen Xin He, not sure, but this is the reading. And then we would possibly see another seal, which will allow us to think that it's genuine. What can genuine mean? Right. It's genuine, the content of silver. Now, let's not forget that Chinese, with great abilities, uh, left uh, China. And there are two periods in the history of Thailand uh, when the Chinese actually moved, and that was in the 13th century, and then there was a big flow of Chinese, uh, again, with enormous abilities, uh, that moved uh, to Thailand. And this happened in the 18th, sorry, the 18th and 19th century. So what did they bring to Thailand? Their abilities. They were looking for a better life not only for themselves, but for their children and their family. And this what was the sacrifice of the Chinese. They integrated, they started to learn the language, and they offer their best work to the nobility, to the aristoc uh, aristocracy. And uh, let's not forget that it's a kingdom and there's basically a king there, and I'm sure many items were made by the Chinese ethnic communities, and they are now part of the museum of the king of Thailand. Beautiful. Right, so we have this pure silver bowl. Pure silver because, bowl. Because you were talking about this, so I was looking at the one in my hand, because every single one of them is an art piece and they are very different. Uh, if you happen to be in the gallery, we place this four on the Blessing Altar, uh, Nitsli. And uh, you can take a look at them. And uh, if you take a look at them, please feel and how delicate and how much details they each of them have. Because everyone, I suppose, is handmade. Absolutely, Absolutely handmade. handmade. So they have uh, all very different details, which I think are uh, worth your time to to admire, and at the back that Mr. Pino has mentioned, there are two seals, I can see it here as well. One with um, uh, enough or pure silver, which would justify that the content, yes. this is more than 95% silver content, and the other would be a name, which yes. would most likely be a Chinese character, by the way, uh, which would be most likely the name of the company or the maker that made this silver. Despite it being in the Siam region, it was made by Chinese silverware person. Yes. And for sure, with such high silver content, in fact, nearly pure, pure silver content, and such delicacy, such intricate work, it would have been for owners and commissioned by very high families. 
uh, very well-to-do families, and they ask themselves that question, I'm rich enough, what should I do? Should I challenge the power of my king? And should I challenge the power of Buddha? No, they decide that they are going to give back and they're going to make something like this and they, in this, they use it as offerings. I ask uh, friends who are in Thailand, actually, do they use this or not? Uh, personally, uh, not exactly. They don't use it personally. It might, the most extent, they might use this as a... Uh, one on the, the family table, but everyone can take from this uh, into their own personal bowl, which will not be made by silver. So at least it was for sharing, at least it was for offering, and so on. So uh, we see two different answers to the question, what if you are one of the wealthiest person on earth? Huh? You can choose whether you want to say that wealth is everything. I think because I'm the richest, I, can, I'm, I have some money, I can... Uh, be, be arrogant about it, or you can, you know, be like them and uh, leave behind a, a, a slew, a, 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 a whole range of wonderful art crafts that's dedicated to a greater spirit, a greater community. There we have it here, right? And uh, this is interesting. This is interesting as well because it has a lot of 3D effect. Uh, this is, again, a very beautiful bowl. Once again, this is Thailand. We don't have any seal at the bottom. We have some writing, which, ignorant as I am, I cannot Thai read. Thai characters. These are Thai characters, uh, yes. It reads, no, I can't read Thai. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably, uh, it's probably that uh, it was, you know, um, because when the Thai, when the Chinese, they migrated to Thailand, most of them were speaking in a particular dialect. And uh, by the phonetics of it, they have uh, actually, yes, there we have it. Uh, they might have actually translated it or written it in the Thai script. It's right? very possible. So yes. if there's anyone who knows Thai out there, you probably can translate back into how it sounds. You might actually get the same meaning that one means pure silver, the other will actually be the sound of the Chinese person or the craftsman who actually made this silver. But uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, the recurring patterns uh, make it uh, very luxurious. So it's definitely not a bowl that's for... If it was meant for as an offering bowl, it was really quite something, right? Um, many people would think that, you know, if you're uh, uh, for the matters of faith, for matters of even feng shui, you know, you just have to be, uh, 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 as long as your heart is pure, that will be done. But I mean, look at this. Look at this craft's work that were done. Uh, it's not about that. It's about whether you are willing to part with your wealth or not. Now, King Jampupati, before he was actually uh, convinced by Buddha, he wasn't because his wealth was his power. These merchants, these high families, they were and they say that, well, I am willing to part with my wealth for a greater cause, for the greater community, for the spirit of Buddhism. And therefore, they had this made and they had offerings inside. There will be elms, there would be offerings to the Buddhahood, to the Sangha, to the monks, and so on. So uh, it, it really begs us to think what, the, once again, the question that we ask at the very beginning of tonight's episode, uh, that what would you do in the event that if you are one of the richest in the whole world? Am I right? Um, the curious thing that you mentioned that um, at least three of these bowls have uh, Chinese inscriptions at the back of it, right? Am I getting old? I can't read uh, that, that, that good anymore. This definitely has. <laughs> this has several hallmarks. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Oh, this is four. But, uh, you know... Several hallmarks. Uh, uh. After a hundred years, uh, it's not that obvious anymore. I still see the word Chinese that says zhu, which means sufficient or enough or a plenty. And uh, there's a name next to it. Ah, there we have it. The name next to it um, where probably will be the, um, you know, the name of the maker. The, the other two seals might be a Thai script of what was mentioned. Yes. So, uh, silver bowls uh, made by the Chinese uh, for the high families in Thailand, in Siam, for offerings. I was just thinking, Mr. Khan, yes. looking at the, at the image that has just been projected, even the details uh, and the details of the back is so interesting. And that's only a detail. 
Imagine the overall. Look at the work. This was something that was felt. And the silversmith, uh, in his own right, to me, was not only somebody who just uh, used to beat with the hammer or some other, pot, other utensils the silver. He really believed in what he was doing. So I find this very, very amazing. Please do come. This is a wonderful collection of Master Yoon, worth taking a look. So this has been collected, as I understand, one piece at a time. They all come from Thailand, where the Chinese silversmith had relocated for their own good and the good of their families. So, and they all have similar characteristics, but different in many, many ways. Again, we're talking about uh, possibly late 19th century or early 20th century. The, the thing that uh, what Chinese have in, I'm, I'm really admiring the, 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 the carvings and the, the, the seals at the end of the, the back of this whole thing. Uh, the Chinese also has a concept yes. of giving. Just like when these families, uh, with all the wealth they had, yes. they decide to actually give and then make the bowls like this for offerings to the Buddhism and Buddhahood at large. Uh, Chinese also have this concept of giving to the community. That means that there is a, a, an, an idea that if, uh, if you're wealthy enough, you should contribute back to the community that has groomed you. And uh, we see that all the time. Just that the direction of the Chinese, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, last, they, they, they don't really contribute into uh, Buddhism and so on, but in their own ways, they give back to society. Um, one of the main things that the Chinese do when it comes to the question, if you are wealthy enough, what would you do? And if you ask the Chinese out there, there might be a few responses. Um, and the first response will be like King Jumbo Party, you know, I, I'll keep all the pictures to myself, I'll buy this, I'll buy that. That's fine, okay, but you know, after tonight's episode, uh, hopefully that, that might not be the final answer. And the second one, if you have observed along uh, throughout history, is that when the Chinese, they are, they are rich enough, or when they come, the question comes upon them, if you're one of the wealthiest person on earth, if you have enough money, what would you do? And then uh, probably they will do a few things. One, they will actually bring the money back to their hometown, and then they will build the roads, build the houses over there as a matter of giving back to where they come from. And uh, another thing that you see, because these silver bowls, after all, were done by overseas Chinese. Yes. Chinese who has left China. Uh, many of us in Singapore might have forgotten the history that actually our ancestors also came all the way from China and they were initially overseas Chinese. And one of the things they did when they were in Singapore and all, over the world, all around the world, actually, when they were wealthy enough, some of the richest merchants, was to actually set up schools. It was their way of answering the question, what if I'm wealthy enough? What should I do? And one of the answers was to, I am going to invest in education. I am going to set up schools. I am going to teach or allow my fellow descendants to be educated. This is one of the things that the Chinese do when they face with the same question. Amazing. Right? So, uh, which brings to the point that uh, the similar thing that we have uh, with what, the, what this uh, high families in Thailand they were doing, uh, pretty much similar to a recent event that Master Yin had in Nanyang Technological University, that he, and uh, in the name of uh, Master Yun, he donated um, a huge amount to Nanyang Technological University in his vest to invest in education. And uh, actually, I have something here that uh, this is a gift from um, this is a gift from NTU itself. It reads uh, in grateful appreciation for establishment of Lotus on Water, Chinese Culture Publications Endowment Fund. Wow. 6th of July 2022. A simple gift to actually acknowledge uh, the funds and the donation given by Master Yun. Here we have actually one of the significant buildings of how NTU or Nanyang Technology, one of the most arcane buildings actually, uh, is currently the Chinese Heritage Center. So once again, the question, when it came upon Master Yun, he decides that, yep, I should give it into education. Uh, and 
Thus, the Lotus on Water Chinese Culture Publication Endowment Fund. Oh, a long name, my God. Let me repeat. Chi Lotus on Water Chinese Culture Publication Endowment Fund was established. There we have it. Uh, in name, this is the award, would you? Uh, in real reality, what Mastering decided to actually sponsor and support was actually this that I have in my hand. Uh, it's called the Nanyang Journal of Chinese Literature and Culture. Uh, right. Two seasons have been uh, published so far. Uh, the fascinating thing about this is that it actually collates all the top tier articles um, of things that could do with Chinese culture. And uh, it actually comes from a different... Uh, and the main editors actually come from three main universities, three important universities. Uh, and you'll realize how important this donation is. Uh, first, of course, of course uh, Nanyang Technological University is the, one of the chief editors representing Singapore. Right. There we have from Harvard University. Representing, Harvard University. Yes, USA. There's the East Asian studies there. They study about East Asia, Japan, Singapore, and so on. Then we have one, three editors. The third one is from Peking University my alma mater, where I graduated from. So this is a combined effort of Singapore, USA, and China. When was the last time that you heard that these countries were cooperating together? I don't <laughs> remember. <laughs> As it always been, that these late latter two are fighting, or in some sort of cold war, that Singapore will be trapped in the middle and say, oh my God, please don't fight because you'll land the rest of us in trouble. Yes. And, uh, but now on this journal, that is actually uh, sponsored by Master Yuen. Uh, these three places are coming together uh, for a very meaningful and significant publications for the good of Chinese language and culture. Singapore, USA and China, the top tier universities from all these three countries. So this is Master Yuen's answer when he was posed the question that, what if you have enough wealth? What would you do? There are many people in Singapore who would choose to actually uh, 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 hold on to the wealth, uh, but not for Master Yin. He decides that he will want to actually give it back to the society in the sense uh, of education. And there we have the birth of this journal, this very important journal that what politicians or what economists might not be able to solve uh, Maustin has put the three important nations and uh, some of them a bit more bickering than others uh, together in the same journal for the good of culture and beyond. Can I just add one more idea? I could be wrong, but it's about peace. Right, yes. And this yeah. world needs peace. And now as Mr. Khan has just mentioned the word bickering, uh, countries bickering, uh, instead Master Yoon with this gesture, is actually leading education. Education is for the future and for the future of humanity. But on top of that, it's a sign of peace. Right. Absolutely. So I often say, I often tell you, I often tell many of my clients that, you know, uh, these four bowls are from Thailand. Am I right? Absolutely, Currently yes. Thailand. Do you know that just behind you and me, Today, I have uh, specially uh, selected paintings that are from more of a bygone past. That uh, we actually had an exhibition. We actually had a huge event in Thailand. Do you know? I, I was made aware about you this. Made aware. Yes. Uh, the first overseas art exhibition that we ever had was in Bangkok, Thailand, 2018, January. It was the, to date, it is still the event that we actually had the most number of paintings exhibited. Right. Uh, one is behind you, one is be, uh, behind me. These were the long, these are the paintings from long ago that actually uh, it was a cross between what an ancient or traditional Chinese painting would be to modern Master Yun's uh, more um, abstract concept of what a peacock might be like. So in this series of paintings, you can still see how a peacock might look like, but with yes. an abundance of colors and the uh, uh, peacocks are getting more playful with, uh, 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 more extravagance of the gold and silver and so on. Uh, much like what we see with the, this is a full silver bowl, okay? I don't know whether you can get the concept correct. It's not a plated silver, it's full silver. There we have it. Um, and these paintings, 
that we have here. When even in those times, I was telling many clients that uh, when you invest in Masterin's art, when you buy one of Masterin's art, you are also buying into a legacy. Uh, you're also collecting or participating in a legacy that supports the Chinese arts and culture and education. You know what it means by that? It's not just about your own benefit. Of course, when you have Masterin's art, your family will prosper and so on. But also that when the question is posed upon both you and Masterin and Lotus of Water, our next step is to focus on things that are not terribly urgent, but important. For instance, the education and the culture of the next generation. So whoever who has invested, if you have invested in Masterin's art, I must congratulate you on a few things. One is that you have owned a great piece of art that has been on the Great Wall of China and to many places. Uh, the second thing is that you have actually partaked in the direction of supporting a scheme, uh, supporting a culture that is bigger than our own egos. That is the whole story that we have with Jumbo Party. Yes. And the difference between what the commissioners of this pure silver bowls they have. It's what you will do with all the wealth that you have. And um, congratulations to you if you have collected Martin's art. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so I, I, uh, we still have quite some, uh, not, I won't say a lot, but uh, some of the paintings from Bangkok. I mean, I, I tell them that it is easy to differentiate if you just go close up to the painting. And if you look at the numbers or the serial number, if it says PBK, if it says uh, PBK, BK means Bangkok, P mm -hmm. means painting. That means that there is a series from the Bangkok series. We don't have too many of them left. PBK, okay, then you have the number. But BK would actually mean that they, are first, they were first exhibited in Bangkok. Um, and uh, that's significant. If you can own, if you have the chance to own a piece of Mastin's art from that era, it would actually have definitely mean it has been, it has increased in value by a lot since then. Yeah. So uh, look out for these paintings. Have the chance to own one for yourself, for your family, and also the same question that I posed to you that the answer would be you are partaking in a legacy forming for the rest of the generations that we have. This was the exhibition when royals appear? Yes, yes, yeah. It was the exhibition that uh, six members of the Cambodian royal family were present for the opening night. Most number of paintings exhibited, most number of royalties are attended the event, opening night. Uh, so it's definitely one to be remembered uh, down history for sure. So it's significant. What an amazing achievement. It is significant. So uh, I hope with this, everyone tonight, they can, uh, we can ask ourselves that question, what would you do with all the money and all the wealth? Uh, you don't have to be extremely, extremely rich. Actually for Singaporeans, as I've met a lot of them every single day, you, there's, there's, a, there's a word in Chinese that says se de. Se de means that are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to give? But if you look at the words, it actually means that are you willing to give and therefore you will get. But the word gives come before the word gets. Right. You will have to give first. Uh, you will have to give first, probably. And then you will that, get, hopefully yeah. you will get. Uh, it's not 100% confirmed, but it seems that in ancient philosophy and wisdom, it seems to be the case. A lot of people with the amount of money they have, they have been stuck by it. They are not willing to give, not even a single cent. But what's the point? then you are, prison, you are prisoners to your own wealth. That's pointless. These people and Master Yun, they have decided that they must give. In fact, this is just one of the many projects that Master Yun actually is giving intensely. Uh, there are many other projects that he has been giving and giving. Of course, hopefully that there will be some returns from it, but who knows? Uh, if you want more information, actually just go and take a look at the speech that he made during the launch of this very endowment fund. Uh, Master has made it quite clear during the speech. Mr. Khan, can yes. I ask you a question? If you were the richest uh, man in this world, what would you do with your wealth? Number one, I don't think the uh, dollars and cents will stay with me for very, for very long. Because 
I don't think the dollars and cents are everything that constitutes what is, is, is not that important actually. Uh, I think I'll be buying a lot of things. Really, yeah, a lot of things. Uh, but friends who know me, that actually they know that I can't drive, uh, so I won't be buying cars. I don't like fancy watches, so I won't be buying a lot of fancy watches. So most probably my money will be in, let's say, endowment funds. Uh, probably I would uh, go back to my alma mater, which is Peking University, and I said, you know, I'm going to have a building in my name. Oh, how wonderful. Probably, yeah, because actually I'm a man, I'm, I'm a person with a uh, uh, simple taste. And uh, a lot of things that, uh, that is happening around me has always been, what good would it do to the next person? Would it benefit this culture? Would it benefit this community? So even at the immediate moment that it seems like it's going to be a loss, sometimes I won't do it. That is the main thing. Even if, if there's a loss? Yeah, but you know, when you put your money in the right place, if you invest in the right place, for instance, for the extension and the promotion of your own culture, you can only say that there's a monetary loss. There might be more benefits that will be coming back to you and your generations, and you never know. I see. I see the point. Right? Well, okay. We... This is something for you to actually ponder about uh, tonight after tonight's episode. huh? Um, we would have to... We have bowls here, but uh, I already got the <laughs> tickets over here. Uh, we would have to actually uh, ask a question and uh, choose the winners from last week. You would have to choose three. And, yes. Um, we're going to ask a uh, question. Um, we should ask about the four bowls. Yes. These four pure silver bowls. Uh, where are they from? That's Good question. A, that's, a, that's a giveaway question. Yeah. Good question. They are made by Chinese, but they're not from China. They're not from China. They are made by Chinese. They're pure silver bowls, made by Chinese, but not, not from China. So where are these four silver bowls from? Yes. It's about 200 plus years from now? Yeah. Approximately, yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, no. This is about 100 plus, 100 plus. This is this, about this, 200 plus. This yeah. is 200 plus. Yeah, these four uh, bowls that are Estimate about 100 years of age, where are they from? Yes. Where were they made? The Chinese migrated to this area and then they gave them their expertise. And uh, those people over there, they asked themselves the important question, I have the sufficient wealth, what I'm going to do about it? I'm going to give back to my community. I'm going to give back to my belief and my faith. So where are these four silver bowls made from? Just comment your answer and uh, you might be chosen as the winner for next week. Now, here we have the three, Mr. Pino. One. Okay, thank you. Number one, we have Madam Lai, Lai Chu Ping. Number one. Congratulations. Thank you. Second, we have uh, Chel Chua. Congratulations. And the third one, we have Ashley Sim. Oh, Ashley, you know her. Very good. Ashley, uh, congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. Ashley. So there we have the three winners from uh, last week's uh, uh, those who answered the correct answer. Um, when you come to the gallery, hopefully you will have the chance to actually take a look at these silver bowls, uh, feel them and uh, think about what we ask you, what are you going to do to actually improve yourself and the community at large, right? And of course, there are upcoming dates that we want to mention that this Saturday is actually the first or the eighth lunar month. Very important. A lot of people are actually preparing for to wear their new collections. Sunday we are, uh, will be my last session of talk on the Wealth Gods, uh, very popular talks. I mean, if you're Chinese, you will love the Wealth Gods. Uh, 4.30 this Sunday. So if you haven't signed up or if you haven't brought your friend over here, this will be a great time for you to do it. And um, with that, uh, till then, next week, we are going to explore more of Mastering's not for sale collections and with that, venture deeper into Mastering's world of feng shui art. Cheers. Cheers.